the basic question we are asking in this paper is, um, to which extent political connections, cronyism, has only a distributional impact or also a dynamic impact on economic growth? So distribution, to which extent uh, some connected businessmen might make more profits and enrich themselves maybe on the, on, on the cost of other businessmen who don't have these connections, or is there really evidence that there's a dynamic effect on economic development and long-term ec economic growth in, uh, in, in the countries? So we do this in the case of Egypt. Let me give a very brief um, uh, summary of the literature. Uh, tiered, it's, that's only the economic literature, so there's uh, many more strands of literature out there, but focus on these. Uh, important to note that uh, uh, first important paper by Fisman found that the value, there's a value to political connections. So politically connected firms are 20% worth more than non-connected firms in Indonesia. This result has been confirmed, for instance, by uh, Ishak and, and Hamuda Shakir for, for the case of Egypt, and also by, uh, by Tarek Hassan and Darren Ashimuglu in a more recent paper on Egypt. So there's a, a positive value in the ballpark of 20% of, uh, of political connections. So it's worth something. There's also a strand of literature which is rapidly expanding on the mechanism. So how do politically connected firms benefit from their connections, what are the mechanisms, how does, does it translate into this larger firm value. Uh, initially, there, was a large, uh, there is a large literature on finance, on banking, uh, so for instance, the case of Pakistan, to show that connected banks are more likely to be bailed out. And uh, more recently, a uh, work by, uh, by Bob Rikers and, and Leila and others, uh, looking at uh, regulation licenses in, in the case of Tunisia, showing that connected firms are more likely to benefit uh, from, from, from regulations than non-connected firms. And uh, this morning we also heard some presentation uh, from, from Adil uh, on, uh, on non-tariff measures, uh, barriers to trade. And finally, there's uh, um, a large literature which compares the performance of connected and unconnected firms. Interestingly there, the results are actually uh, um, ambiguous, so there's uh, several papers that find that connected firms are more profitable, are more productive than non-connected firms, however, in a couple of papers also show, for instance, the case of, of France, or in the case of European countries, a study by Fascio, that connected firms are not necessarily more profitable than unconnected firms. Having said all that, there is to some extent a gap in the literature to which extent these connections have an impact on economic growth, have a dynamic impact on economic development. So. Based on that, the key, key, uh, this paper, we try to make a step forward to address this question, to answer, to, to get a bit close on answering the question if these firm values only have distribution impact or indeed if there's a dynamic effect on economic growth. Let me quickly go to the theoretical literature. So um, also in the theoretical literature, it's not clear, so the results are ambiguous. There is a, a, um, a strand of theoretical papers, Murphy, Schleifen, and Wishney, that argue that in development, the process of economic development, there can be coordination failure, so one small investor under uncertainty doesn't have enough funds to invest. So in that case, actually, if, uh, if, if um, funds are channeled through a connected businessman, this might help to overcome these coordination failures and get large-scale investment going, which otherwise would not happen. Okay? And there are various uh, variations of this argument by Ricardo Hausmann and others. On the other hand, there's also a theoretical argument that basically connected firms uh, inefficiently lobby for, for, uh, for their connections, uh, which protect them from competition, which kills the incentives of firms to, to innovate and to, uh, to become more productive. So this kind of literature, pulley connections have a negative effect. Uh, most recently, or maybe the most... Uh, most um, Detail paper on this is by Aguillon and colleagues, uh, who actually show that uh, in sectors where you have uh, a few firms which last, which are large, with a large exogenous cost advantage, for instance, due to political connections, and you have a lot of firms which have much higher cost, in this sector, all firms have less incentive to innovate, have less incentive to, uh, to um, invest in more productive activities. So the laggards, the very unproductive small firms, they basically cannot compete, they cannot bridge that gap to the few connected large firms, so they have no incentive to innovate. And the large firms, they don't face any serious competition within the sector, so they also have really not uh, a, a lower incentive potentially to innovate. So in, in these sectors, we should expect less innovation than in sectors where firms have a head-on-head -head, uh, cost and a head-on-head -head competition in order to, to innovate. Now, 
we argue that uh, the first case of coordination failure is more relevant for low-income countries where there is a coordination failure and there is a potential lack of, of, of large-scale investments in certain sectors. However, that when countries transit to, to middle-income countries uh, and some initial investment took place and the demand externalities in the new sectors emerging in manufacturing and services, there the efficiency of firms within that sector is crucial to further develop. So in these cases, the competition argument, the second argument might be most relevant. So the hypothesis we test is that connected firms in Egypt uh, did create jobs, but they did not create enough jobs. And at the same time, they suppressed competition within their sector and discouraged the majority of firms in this sector, which are not connected, to invest and innovate, and by that reduced, the, in the aggregate, uh, the number of, of employment growth in the country. So the contribution, the main contribution is that we construct a novel database um, of firms in the Mubarak uh, area, which are connected to the Mubarak regime. I will say a little bit more about that uh, soon. Importantly, uh, we use the fact that uh, a lot of these connections um, expanded and co politically connected firms expanded in Egypt and entered many new sectors in manufacturing and service sectors in the beginning of 2000 arguably due to an exogenous shift in the regime in economic policy. So the regime uh, had to uh, uh, deliver and had to uh, improve performance of the private sector. Uh, many of the, we already discussed it, many of politically connected firms got into very high level positions in the government uh, at that time in leading policy committees or, or becoming ministers. And we also observe a lot of entry of connected firms into new activities, into previously unconnected uh, sectors in the manufacturing and, and service sector. So this a kind of uh, variation in the data we try to exploit uh, moving forward to see what happened to these sectors where connected firms entered relative to similar sectors where they didn't enter. Um, so based on that, we document uh, uh, for the first time, there was written before this conference, so uh, there's a lot of other papers in there, so it's one of the first times that the impact of cronyism on growth. And we provide also as an area of supporting evidence to show that the mechanism behind this is consistent with the theoretical work of Ogion and others, uh, which, we, uh, which, which I just mentioned, uh, where we show you some, some robustness checks, so to speak. So our main finding, since I have little time, so I might not get to all the findings, so let me quickly summarize in the beginning. Um, so we use this uh, quasi-experimental -ex setting. Um, we look into uh, four-digit uh, economic sectors that experienced uh, the entry of connected firms between 1996 and 2006 and compare their growth with uh, comparable sectors, similar sectors, that did not ex uh, experience the entry of connected firms. So we see if connected firms, uh, if sectors after the entry of connected firms performed better or worse than similar sectors that remained unconnected over the same time period. So we use this quasi-experimental setting uh, in, in our analysis. Um, we put quite a bit of effort to show you that this result is not due to selection effects. So if connected firms enter sectors that are intrinsically less productive, then our results might be just driven by this, by this exogenous, endogenous uh, variation. However, we, we do quite a bit of effort and hope, hopefully convince you that this is not the case. That a priori, actually, connected firms in Egypt entered sectors that were more profitable, so we should have expected higher growth of these sectors. However, over a 10-year period, we find that this was not the case. And finally, we find that uh, when connected firms entered sectors, we find that the distribution of, of, uh, of employment across firms in these sectors becomes more skewed, meaning we observe after the entry that we have a few firms which are very large. However, the, the, the majority of firms in these sectors become smaller, they shrink. Either they exit or they shrink. So the, the, the firm size distribution becomes more skewed, which is consistent with the model of, of Philippe Aguillon, showing that uh, if you're not connected and in a connected sector, you have no incentive to innovate and you, you kind of specialize into small market niches in order to survive. And we find the evidence consistent with this. And we show uh, various mechanisms how um, in, in Egypt, uh, the connected firms benefited from privileges that reduce competition in that sector. For instance, uh, through trade protection, for instance, through energy subsidies to industry, or from access to land or of a favorable regulatory in, in enforcement. And finally, we show actually that consistent, these privileges explain the larger profits of these establishments uh, in the private sector. I'll say a little bit more about that. So 
let me be brief here because we heard uh, a lot about uh, um, kind of uh, the development of the private sector in Egypt from people that have many much more knowledge than me about this. Let me say, however, that we distinguish two phases of the Mubarak regime. Uh, a first one with a gradual economic opening without a political liberalization, where some uh, sectors were open to private investments, strategic sectors such as telecom steel construction. However, we think it's important to distinguish between a second period of, of, of the Mubarak uh, uh, rule um, in, in the around 2000, where in addition to that, we, s we observe that uh, connected business elites take up top political posts and also enter many new activities in the, in, in the country. So to s uh, we observe in this period that there's a macro stabilization, economic reforms, uh, we observe privatization and openness to trade at the same time. It's, however, during the 2000s, private investment and formal sector job creation remains relatively small, so the performance of the, the economy is to some extent underperformance, and we observe a rise of non-tariff barriers, high concentration in bank lending, and energy subsidies to industries, which are some potential privileges. So some potential uh, conflicting results, and we argue that uh, this period basically is a policy shift in the Mubarak regime, and uh, it basically opened up further to the private sectors Importantly, to, to s open to, to specific group of the, of the private sector, um, allowed basically for some businessmen to enter, enter politics, and also uh, paved the way for these businessmen to, uh, to enter new activities and to enter into new sectors, which is what we observe in this time period. How do we measure politically connected firms? So, uh, as Ishak indicated, the first, take is to, uh, the first thing we did is we created a list of politically connected firms in Egypt by uh, looking at uh, board members of think tanks, by having interviews with banks and the private sector. Importantly, in a second step then, uh, which goes back to, to Abla's question, in a second step, we actually, uh, out, of this, out of this group, we identify firms, uh, we identify businessmen that had a clear conflict of interest. So we identify businessmen that at the same time had a high political position. For instance, being a minister or leading a policy committee in the National Democratic Party. For instance, Ahmed S. was not uh, a minister, but he led the policy committee in the National Democratic Parties uh, since 2002. And uh, so he had a direct influence on policy making in the country. So this is uh, most of our, our politically connected firms, actually firms where the owners had, a, had this clear conflict of interest. They could influence directly policy making. And at the same time, there were business owners in, in, in the private sector. In addition to that, I should say that we add a few firms also which we consider, where we consider the owner to be longtime friends of, 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 of Mubarak. There are a couple of cases uh, where, where we document that uh, there was a long-term relationship between this businessman and the Mubarak family, which might have uh, led to privileges, even though these, these persons, uh, is a few, did not have uh, directly uh, political connected, sorry, did not have high political posts. So doing that, um, we find... Uh, we have different uh, definitions of connections. We have uh, the most stringent definition where um, a politically connected firm is owned by a politically connected businessman plus a, a businessman, uh, sorry, politi politician and politically connected businessman is the CEO of the firm. We have firms where that are just owned by connected firms but has an independent CEO. And finally, we have uh, also include, uh, in addition, firms where, where a politician, a businessman, is basically uh, a board member. Okay. In the most broad case, it leads to 385 firms here that operate in 155 out of 320 four-digit sectors. We use additional data from the Egyptian establishment census data in 1996 and 2002, which has more than 2 million establishments, so it's, it's, it's literally all establishments with a fixed location, so no street vendors. Uh, so we use that to compute employment growth at the four-digit uh, uh, sector level between these two years. And later on, we use additional information to see which, uh, to look deeper at, at the mechanism which types of, uh, of uh, privileges politically connected firms benefit from. So the key exercise is to, to estimate basically uh, to which extent there was an impact on growth. So after the entry of crony firms into previously unconnected sectors, how did these sectors perform relative to similar sectors that remained unconnected? So for that, we use this uh, policy shift in the beginning of 2000 that uh, private uh, businessmen entered into politics and expanded their activities and entered many new uh, four-digit manufacturing and service sectors where they previously were not active to identify the effect. So to be precise, we observed 35 uh, connected firms that entered into 
26 out of 165 previously unconnected four-digit sectors between 1996 and 2006. And then we use the difference in difference estimation to see if sectors which were entered by connected firms, were previously unconnected, performed better or worse than sectors that remained unconnected. Okay. Important, uh, in, this, in this exercise, we control for characteristics of these sectors. So for instance, we control for broad sector characteristics. So we only compare four-digit sectors that experience crony entry and, that, and, and, and sectors that remained unconnected that are in the same broad sector category and that uh, basically have the same average firm size in the same maturity. Um, uh, so we control for the average age and the average size in, in these sectors in the exercise. Importantly, um, the identification assumption here is that uh, politically connected firms did not enter into sectors that are intrinsically lower growth sectors, right? So if political connect for whatever reason entered into sectors that between 1996 and 2006 had lower growth uh, opportunities, then our results would be explained by this endogeneity. And we will show you some graphs that this was not the case. So what do we find? We find that uh, in, in the results in both, so the let me uh, not go in detail to the, to the, to the regression table, I'll just say uh, we find um, for all of these different measures, the most stringent one where connected firms are measured by being owned by a connected businessmen and the CEO is a connected businessman being just owned or the broadest measure, we find that there's a significant effect of crony enter into sector performance. So, so for instance, in the, in the case of, uh, in the middle case, of firms that are owned by, by, by po politicians, by politically connected businessmen, we find that between 1996 and 2006, they grew 18.7 percentage point less, so employment growth was 80.7 percentage point lower after their entry than in similar sectors they did not enter. Okay, so that comes about to 2% less employment growth uh, every year. Okay, so we find a strong result that these sectors underperformed. Moreover, we find that uh, after connected firms entered into these sectors, the em employment distribution in these sectors changed. So the, uh, the blue line is the distribution of employment um, across, uh, uh, across firms, um, initially in 1996. And the red line is th the same sector distribution after the entry of connected firms um, in 2006. And we see basically that uh, there are uh, to the right, there, um, on the red line, there are few firms uh, that are very large that emerge. However, the majority of firms in these sectors become smaller, so the whole distribution shifts to the left. So this is evidence that after the entry of connected firms into initially unconnected sectors, we see a more skewed employment distribution towards, towards smaller firms, which is consistent with the mechanism of Agio and others. Now, the key identifying assumption we have is that these sectors crony firms enter, did not have kind of intrinsically lower growth opportunity. So first of all, let's, let's say that uh, given uh, the literature by Roll or Löwe and others, it actually seems implausible that the connected firms enter the sector which has a lower growth uh, opportunity uh, to start with. Um, what we do in addition is we look for, show for instance that sectors which crony firm enters were not more major. So on average, uh, firms in sectors that crony firms enters were actually younger than firms in sectors uh, where they did not enter. So that seems to, to suggest that uh, uh, there was uh, uh, more younger firms, there were overall uh, more entry in, in, in previous years into these sectors. So these were potentially dynamic sectors and not major sectors such as heavy industry sectors in the economy. A second exercise we do is we compare the growth of these, uh, or we look at the growth rates of these sectors that crony firms entered in Egypt over the same period in other countries. So we look how exactly these, these, these sectors performed in, in other developing countries. And what we find is that in other developing countries, these sectors perform better relative to the same sectors that remained unconnected in Egypt, okay? So if we look at all countries, all developing countries, we find uh, that, that uh, these sectors perform significantly better. In other MENA countries, uh, we do not find a difference, so the performance between these groups was the same. However, strikingly, while in the rest of the world these sectors, crony firms enter, seem to have performed better, in Egypt they performed worse. So this gives us uh, um, confidence and, and some, some, uh, some confidence, hopefully convincingly, that 
the firms, the sectors that fully connect firm, firms enter uh, have higher growth opportunities. However, after the entry uh, of fully connected firms, we see a shift in the employment distribution in these sectors and the unconnected firms in this sector actually perform worse. So overall, the, the performance in this sector is, is much worse. So let me say, uh, to, to finalize, let me give uh, some supporting evidence that on the mechanism of how this happened. So if we take a step back in the, in the model of Anglia and others, crucial is that uh, there are some privileges for few firms, for connected firms, that uh, gives them a cost advantage of unconnected firms, which explain their better performance. And we find in the case of Egypt that uh, one, one example of these privileges is energy subsidies to industry. So um, for instance, in high energy industry, high energy intensive industries, which obtained the bulk of energy subsidies to industry in Egypt, about 10 billion US dollar in 2010, 45% of the connected firms operate, but only 8% of the unconnected firms. And the difference is statistically significant. We find similar benefits in terms of trade protection. Uh, Adir talked about this uh, this morning. Uh, so let me, let me skip it here. And we also find uh, that um, uh, connected firms benefited from greater access to land, um, to credit, and were more likely to operate in, in industrial zones. So these are some of the mechanisms of the privileges they obtained. So let me conclude. We find in Egypt that a small number of entrepreneurs have managed to control a rising and substantial share of the Egyptian formal private sector over time. Politically connected firms tend to operate behind trade barriers. Uh, they disproportionately benefit from energy subsidies to industries. Um, they are more likely to be in industrial loans, zones. They obtain more bank loans and they, are, they benefit from fast track regulatory enforcement in Egypt. They're not more, if, so we find that they're more profitably efficient. However, they're more profitably efficient only because of these privileges. So we find that, for instance, the, the energy subsidies and the trade protection exactly explain some, the higher productivity of connected firms' profitability in Egypt. And most importantly, we find that job creation declines after the entry of crony firms into initially unconnected sectors. Okay? So after the entry of crony firms into initially unconnected sectors, they obtain the privileges, they change the market structures, and aggregate growth in this sector declined over the following 10 years by a significant amount. So that means actually that uh, the entry of connected firms into these sectors has some job creation, but in the aggregate, the job creation in this sector was significantly lower than in similar sectors that remained unconnected. So that implies indirectly that it was exactly the non-connected firms, it's the majority of firms in these sectors, that underperformed, that were discouraged to, to invest, that were discouraged to innovate, and therefore, uh, even though connected firms by itself have created jobs in Egypt, their presence, their privileges, that which suppressed competition and innovation dynamics in these sectors, led to a negative aggregate performance at the sector level uh, of these sectors. So they would have grown, the sectors would have grown stronger in the absence of the entry of connected firms in Egypt. And finally, uh, we find that these effects are not only statistically significant, but also quantitatively significant. Um, so if we just look at the energy subsidies, um, the energy subsidies amounted to almost 2.9% to of GDP in 2010, energy subsidies to industry only, mostly consumed by connected businessmen. Uh, that was 50% of the overall public investment budget, which was 6% at the time in Egypt. So it's a significant amount which has been diverted to firms away from public investment. And importantly, we find uh, that uh, employment growth after the entry of connected firms was 19 to 25% lower than it otherwise would have been, which amounts to about 2% uh, of average annual employment growth in Egypt. Thank you. <laughs>